ISM New Jersey. Today's theme is a woman's perspective on resiliency. Our diverse female panel will explore the relationship between procurement, resiliency, and managing during uncertainty. I'd like each of you to leave this session with three takeaways on how to be resilient during stressful, uncertain times. I'm Sarah Scudder, president of Real Sourcing Network and panel moderator. I've spent my career in the marketing space. I started out doing marketing. I transitioned into marketing procurement, and now I run a tech company in the print and marketing services procurement space. Resiliency has played a big role in my life in the past five years as I've transitioned from corporate America to running a tech procurement startup. I have failed a lot, have been told no more times than I can count, and have had to pivot and reset our growth and strategy several times. All of this requires a tremendous amount of resiliency to not dwell on the past and move forward. So with that, I'd like to kick off our panel discussion, and we're gonna start with Eva. And Eva, if you can start off by introducing yourself to the group, and then I'd like you to talk about your definition of resilience and how you define it and what visible behaviors you find in a resilient person and a resilient supplier. Uh, great. Um, thank you, Sarah. So first, a short introduction. So uh, my name is Eva Milko. Uh, majority of my career, so uh, probably the last 30 some years, I, I've been in the procurement and supply chain roles, uh, primarily in the telecommunications and consumer product sectors. Most recently, um, many of you or some of you may remember me um, as the person who ran the U.S. desk for procurement leaders. Um, a procurement uh, membership and subscription organization. And now I engage with C-level clients across the U.S. in my own consulting practice, uh, moving more towards change management, transformation, and human capital. Um, and I also lecture full-time at University of Denver. Um, now, when it comes to the topic of resilience, gosh, I could talk about this for hours, uh, but you know, as a professor, I love to talk, you know, talk a lot, <laughs> but I will distill it down to just a few takeaways for you all. Um, we often think of resilience, and, and Sarah touched on this, as a sort of an ability to withstand, um, sort of a physical and mental toughness, you know, some of us more recently call it grit, um, you know, so think of an image of a flower or a tree that sprouts from cracks in the concrete or rock and, and we're amazed and we say, well, how is that possible? Um, so being able to show signs of life and, and, and thriving where there shouldn't really be any room to do so is how I would capture the essence of resilience. But I think we need to unpack it just a little bit more and, and look at it from a behavioral perspective. When we define a resilient person, uh, what do we mean by that? I'm going to um, talk about just very quickly three things. The first one is just a simple change of mind. You will endure because you choose to. And there is a willingness in a person that's resilient. There's a willingness to thrive even in the most difficult circumstances. You can expand that out to your supplier base as you're looking at them and you're looking at their past and their history. Is there a willingness to thrive uh, on their most difficult of times. Resilient people have a confidence level that says, you know, this too shall pass. There's a wisdom and confidence in those statements. Um, second um, is that they engage. That's it, they engage. Uh, you know, you don't get resilient from the comfort of your couch. Okay, and so um, they continue to enter the arena, as, as Brene Brown uh, would, would say, they continue to get involved, they continue to get, um, to get engaged, even despite the difficult circumstances. And then finally, uh, they tend to be super ruthless about letting go of stuff that doesn't serve them anymore. Um, and, and interestingly enough, they do it rather quickly. So, so I would say that there's also an element of agility to that ruthlessness of just shedding 
um, the, the things and the, the sort of the skin, skin of the past so they can, in fact, thrive in the new environment. Oh, I think it's very fitting that you're wearing a flower today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I, a lot of what you just talked about, I think it goes back to my core and, and kind of how I've spent my career. And I know Heather will address on this as well as you, you have the whole world of entrepreneurs and they're going out and taking big risks and they're being resilient day in and day out. And they have to let stuff go because a lot of things don't work and you, you have a lot of failures. So I think that ties nicely into the whole young supplier startup community that we're seeing thriving um, in the United States. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Elena, I want to shift the conversation uh, over to you a little bit and talk about how you define and approach resiliency in your work. And, and I'd like you to start off by introducing yourself. And I know you're a published author, so tell us a, about your, your books as well. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Noel, and I'm the founder and principal of Inspiring Accountability in the Workplace. So I would do leadership consulting around employee engagement and accountability. And I'm also a certified neuro-linguistic programming practitioner. And so I'm very familiar with using the brain as uh, and kind of our human dynamics. What is our natural default? So working with what makes us human instead of trying to fight against it. Uh, so that's really my place of passion. Um, in my two books, Inspiring Accountability in the Workplace, uh, both on Amazon, and then Happiness is Overrated, Live the Inspired Life Instead. So I love all aspects of bringing inspiration to this world because, boy, do we need it, right? So um, my approach on resiliency and my kind of definition is moving from feeling anxious to feeling empowered. And I find that that journey is where we move. Really, that is the difference. When we feel empowered, it's hard not to feel resilient. And when we feel anxious, it's hard to feel resilient. So I'll be exploring that journey uh, today. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Sharon Melnick is, stress occurs when the demands of a situation exceed your perceived ability to control them. Even the mere perception of control reduces the stimulation of a stress re response. So we're going to be looking at what is the journey for me to get away from that anxious stress response and into that place um, where that's getting lowered and my empowerment is going up. And so that journey for me, I see that as five steps. So that's at first we're feeling anxious and we all experience a different flavor of anxiousness. For some, it's more worry, um, fear, panic, uh, shut down, needing connection. It, it's very different for everyone. Um, and then we would move kind of up the ladder a little bit to, to understanding where our resistance is. So identifying and releasing our resistance. And resistance is um, it's kind of elusive. Sometimes you know it when you feel it, but whatever we're resisting about our experience, kind of like a, a form of denial, whatever we are trying to hold back is actually locking it in. So the more we're resisting something, the more we are perpetuating it. And we are, we're creating this tension of, I don't want this and yet it's here. And so we kind of want to go through the stages of grief to be able to reduce the resistance so that we can make different choices. So the next step, number three, is coming into a place of feeling acceptance or accepting what is, not saying it's okay, but okay, this is happening. And I think that really can mix us up as we think if I accept this, if I don't show that I'm resisting it, then it means it's okay. Absolutely not. And this is all in service of our own experience, right? How do we have a better experience when things, which we have a, such a list today, are going on? Um, so again, not, not it's okay, but okay, this is happening. Because from there, we can move to step four, which is accessing our resourcefulness, coming back to a resourceful place. And that can be done by upgrading our beliefs, which come from our thoughts and the meanings we make. I'll talk a little bit about that. It can come from choosing realistic optimism. Um, we'll talk about that. And then also choosing where we put our attention. Where we put our attention is essentially what is defining the experience we have and then the related thoughts and emotions that come with that. So bringing some choice in from a resourceful place. And then finally, we can access that feeling of empowerment where we've reestablished self-efficacy. We feel we have some choice 
we feel we can take some type of action for our own well-being. So that's how I look at resiliency. Elena, I, I host a procurement meetup every week um, for the buy side community. And one of the things that's really come up a lot is people having challenges managing working from home with children. And I would love your thoughts on your five-step process and how people can use that to better manage working from home while also being a teacher and having small children at home. Yeah, and I think when we get to that third question, I'm gonna offer some questions that will help prompt us from moving from step to step. But what I will just immediately say, because I do do training for managing remote work workers, um, you know, we can't do the impossible. Um, and and there, I really feel like someone who is in that position who's supposed to be educating their children, taking care of their children and working full time and like being focused. And, and uh, running a hotel and being a chef. Yeah, I mean, there's just, we, can, we can't, you know, there's certain limits. And I think that um, that's where I think something I hope that's coming out right now is more compassion and more empathy. And, um, and all we can do is try to make better choices for ourselves, but that requires us to get to that resourceful place. So I think probably from all of the panelists, we're going to hear tips on that. But yeah, we can't do the impossible. All we can do is make kind of the best choice that's on our menu and kind of add more choices to our menu um, so that they're available for us to choose. So happy to come back to that. Okay, great question. Thank you, Elena. All right, Heather, I'm gonna shift the conversation now to Heather, you are have a very different perspective than our other panelists. You actually run your own company. Um, I would consider it to be a small business. So you're a supplier and you're dealing with all the challenges that are coming with um, potentially clients freaking out, calling you all the time, needing your counseling and support, but also a reduction in sales and, and figuring out how you're going to survive uh, during this time. So Heather, as a supplier in the midst of this craziness, what has resiliency meant to you? Oh gosh. Well, first off, as, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Heather Foch and I'm the interim CEO of Alpha B2B. Um, my background has been in, in sales from the get-go. Our company is uh, a reseller of printer cartridge supplies and related meat and services. So I've spent um, a majority of my career working with procurement professionals on helping reduce their indirect spend um, for those categories. Um, so over the years, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from many of the procurement folks that are, are in my connection list, uh, which I, I deeply value. Um, and I think resiliency to me, um, especially during this pandemic, has meant perceiving during adverse conditions, whatever those might be. It could be at work, it could be at home, transitioning to working from home, as we've already uh, mentioned via Sarah, um, you know, if you've got kids at home, uh, different ages, you're having to teach, you're having, you know, your spouse might also be at home and maybe you have calls at different times and maybe not enough workspace to be able to do all of those functions. Um, so for me, it's meant um, just trying to keep a, a steady head and persevere. And whether that means accomplishing in my day a little bit or I accomplish a lot, um, it is, um, Elena sort of touched base on being compassionate and having empathy. It's, it's self-care and knowing that, you know, at the end of the day, I did all that I could accomplish, um, whether it be a lot or a little, and being okay with that, being knowing that it was enough, and, and knowing that tomorrow is another day. I have another day to accomplish more of the things that I want to uh, complete on my, my to-do list. Um, I do definitely think that empathy is a huge part of being resilient, and I think um, what a lot of people felt at the beginning of COVID was that feeling of vulnerability. And I know, Eva, you mentioned Brené Brown, one of my favorite TED Talks she's given, and I've rewatched it dozens of times, is, is the one that she does on vulnerability. Um, nobody likes to feel vulnerable, and it puts us in a very precarious, you know, anxious sort of situation. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, with this new reality we've all sort of found ourselves in, regardless of what industry you're in, regardless if you work professionally or you are a stay-at-home parent, um, we've all been sort of thrust into this situation together. 
And, and from what I've seen so far, everyone has been able to provide, at least that I've been in contact with, um, with that empathy, with self-care, with taking time to self-grow, you know, whether it's professional or, or personally, um, and just being able to um, realize at the end of the day that, you know, if we can help each other, if we can, you know, be that ear for a colleague or a friend, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's going to help all of us sort of get through the situation that we're all in. And Heather, one of the things I think you have a unique, unique perspective being a female business owner running a, a, a small um, company in the procurement space is the idea around how procurement professionals can better support small suppliers during this time. And I know one of the things that, that I've talked to a lot of people about is the importance of picking up the phone and having a conversation. And I think that goes a long way in building connections and helping your entire community be resilient and get through this together. I think companies who are sending out electronic surveys right now to suppliers is not the right approach and strategy. Hey, how are we performing right now? How would you rate us on a scale of one to 10, right? That is not showing empathy. That is not showing support. So I think it's really important for procurement professionals to think about their supplier community, especially those minority or small suppliers, and think about how they can support and help with their resiliency as well. I completely agree. Um, at the end of the day, being a small business owner, um, I believe our country was is supported hugely by all of the different small businesses across the country. And so when small businesses have had an opportunity to work with big companies, um, it does help hugely to have that open door communication, picking up the phone, having a 10 minute, 30 minute conversation with, and not just when, when times are lean, when we're all going through something, it's, it's throughout the whole relationship so that you know that you've, you know, you've been able to build that relationship with that person. And at the end of the day, you know, when times are lean, when times are tough, you can actually have those awkward, hard conversations without it being awkward and hard because you've already established that connection with each other. You can actually speak, you know, as, as real humans and not, you know, just, you know, Autobots, you know, reciting things out of, you know, a company policy and procedures handbook. Yep. So Eva, I want to shift the conversation back to you. Um, supply chain and procurement are two heavily, heavily impacted areas during the pandemic. I think every time I turn on the news or get on Google, I'm seeing those words come through um, a lot, whether it's small companies, big companies, it's just a hot topic right now. What steps would you recommend that we take now to increase our resilience? Yeah, um, yeah, before I uh, make my remarks, I, I definitely agree with uh, what uh, my prior speakers were saying. There's a, a tremendous amount of learning that, you know, we're taking away out of this, um, out of this, um, boy, what, eight weeks? Feels like forever, but it's really been only eight or ten weeks. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite sayings when I was in procurement was, um, never waste a good crisis, right? Um, and, you know, this, this is the time where procurement and supply chain professionals uh, can really step up to the plate. Um, any headline, as you said, Sarah, you know, that I've heard, it's all about supply chain. Supply chains are the bloodline, really, for much of this, this pandemic. And when that bloodline ain't working, uh, we begin to see and begin to become, again, aware of our vulnerabilities, right? Um, uh, there's no doubt that we tend to become complacent, you know, during times of success. And uh, we become super responsive uh, in times of crisis. And I think it is exactly those levels of responsiveness that help us build resilience. Um, and being able to recognize that, you know, it is not in times of success that resilience is built. Resilience is built when things are not going well. Uh, the, the, the oxymoron of that is that we really don't know how to do well with things that are not going well, okay? And that's, I think, where the rub comes in. And so, you know, what I always say to my clients is um, executing the basics is the key to building resilience, okay? One of my favorite books is um, Atomic Habits, right? So it's these 
tiny little things that we could be doing every day, repeatedly, day in, day out, to help build our immune system, to help build our ability to, to withstand and be resilient. Look, shortcuts are excellent and shortcuts are good, but only if you have a good foundation to fall back on when the shortcuts are not working. And oftentimes we tend to value shortcuts uh, to monetization or shortcuts to savings without really understanding the, the, the basics and the basics that need to be in place. So, you know, I still find it amazing how few companies have um, good visibility to their spend. Um, and this is just, you know, still shocking to me. We still talk about 20 years later about spend visibility. And I, you know, scratch my head and I'm like, you know, at which point are we going to understand what we have as procurement professionals to work with, right? Uh, it is not until you understand what you have that you can actually do something um, about it. You know, I'm reminded of a story that, that Bill Coors used to tell us. You know, I used to work for Coors Brewing Company and Bill, Bill Coors used to say to us, before the prohibition, you know, there were 700 breweries and after the prohibition, only a few survived. And so why did we survive as a company? Well, we survived not because we were making beer, we survived because we looked at what is it that we have that will allow us to go through these difficult times. And we, we knew how to do malt, right? And so malted milk became sort of the product that, you know, paid our way through the difficult time. Being able to convert what you have into something that still continues to deliver value. Well, if you don't have spend visibility as a procurement team, how on earth um, can you um, can you convert it, you know, to something uh, more meaningful. So spend visibility is, is one area that I think I would say procurement really needs to continue to build their basics on. The, the second area is category management. You know, category management will take on a whole new meaning when it comes uh, to the world of resilience, right? So for ages, we were centralizing and, and, and automating and, and kind of bringing things together in, in terms of uh, building scale. Well, resilience actually asks for the opposite. So how diverse is your supplier base? Okay, do you have an option A, B, and C? And, and how do you now structure these contracts to motivate all three uh, to be sort of on your supplier roster? Um, you know, onshoring and, and offshoring, you know, uh, uh, looking at a different blend of, of processes and options where, you know, it used to be that we were sort of very, driven towards a certain uh, economic agenda. Now, a lot of that is, is, is being reconsidered and as category managers, you need to sort of understand your basics of your category to step back and, and rethink, you know, what your model is gonna look like uh, in, in the future. And then finally, I would say as a function and, and as a company in general, and I'm, I'm certainly learning from that myself is, you know, increasing the speed of decision-making, you know, I, I am continuously shocked at, you know, in, in good times, we have committees, we have advisory sessions, we have study sessions, we have, you know, 20 meetings to discuss an idea. Uh, guys, we don't have the time for that anymore. And so really thinking about how do you increase the speed of your decision making process? Who are the people who are empowered to make the decisions? Um, who are the seven touch points that have to be made? Uh, uh, maybe take three of them out because they don't really add value. Really looking at, you know, your decision-making processes um, because in times of crisis, that's what's going to make or break you, the ability to quickly pivot and make, and make some of those decisions. So building those muscles both, you know, physically and emotionally and mentally at the basic level, I think, can really help us as a function uh, to increase our resilience in the, in the long run. And Eva, I think one of the important things to talk about in the speed to market, you, you mentioned that things take a long time, right? And, and procurement has historically been known for being slow and delaying processes. One of the big challenges is the contracting process. I know I have personally been involved in contracts that have taken eight months. So something that I think companies really need to look at is 
developing a template structure for contracting where you have an approved contract ready to go and you have a simple appendix where suppliers can add terms or conditions and you can quickly get a contract executed. But in times like this, when you are having contracts take three, six, eight, 12 months, it's just, it's just not gonna work when you're in a time of crisis and you need to move things quickly. Well, and you know, and I, I love that, um, Sarah, because we, uh, we grappled with that you know, 15 years ago and, and we still grapple with it, right? Um, some of the things that I will, will add to this, to this point is as a, as a possible solution, you know, the, 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 the contracting process and the language is really embedded in the company's ability to manage its risk, right? So a lot of the things that we do as procurement team really um, is it comes from what I would call the, the legal side of the house, right? If you have attorneys that are super risky uh, and, and there are not many of them, but you know, typically they're very risk averse. And so they will actually mandate you to build these processes and build these, you know, barricades and build these templates. Why? Because in their mind, they're somehow managing the risk for the company, right? Um, what we used to do, and I think that's something that's still pretty relevant, is to really look at each of the categories in the context of its risk to the company, right? Um, and this is not one size fits all. So not all categories require a 2000 page contract. Um, and again, as a category manager, if you can really understand where you fall into the spectrum of your category of spend in the company, and how risky or not risky your category is, I think then the templates can then be, you know, provided to kind of support that level of category. And I, again, I, I think this is a collaboration between, you know, procurement, the, the legal function and, and finance where we need to have those conversations. And Eva, the, the final note I'll make about what you just talked about is I think there's so much importance now in becoming a customer of choice. And during times like this, the companies that collaborate and treat their partners as a we instead of an I, they're the ones who are the customers of choice and they're the ones getting the masks and they're the ones getting the PPE. So I think it's essential for procurement teams to set up strategies and programs and structures for your strategic suppliers to work in collaboration as a team to be a customer of choice. Yep. No, no doubt about it. Uh, in fact, I listened to uh, uh, Michael uh, Kadu yesterday on his webinar. Uh, you know, he, he brought up an excellent point, which is, you know, quit being, you know, a, a set of sheep that sort of follow the rest of the sheep. You know, everybody is saying we got to extend for current, you know, payment terms because times are tough. You know, and, and he really called out this opportunity to be different and, and look at, you know, cash and payment terms is actually a differentiating factor uh, right now to uh, become that customer of choice um, rather than just following, you know, the, the, the proverbial herd of everybody's extending terms, therefore we must extend terms, you know. It's really understanding your spend, understanding where you are in, in the marketplace, understanding um, you know, what your realities are, and then working with those suppliers to have those conversations as to who's going to fund, you know, some of these potential, uh, potential changes that you're looking to make in the, in the process. So, uh, you know, I completely echo what he had to say, stop, you know, stop following the herd, understand you, understand what you have, and then make decisions based on that. Well, after... Uh, pose an idea to Kathy to do another webinar on payment terms. I think we could have an hour-long discussion about that topic. And congratulations to Mike at the Procurement Foundry. It's his one-year anniversary, so he's built quite an impressive community. Yeah. So Elena, I want to transition back to you. You do a lot of work studying the brain and, and how it functions, and of course this is really important when we talk about resiliency. So how does the brain affect resiliency? And what questions can be used to redirect the brain's attention towards resiliency? Okay, yeah, well, I think everything that Eva just shared, I wrote down like, what is your malted milk? You know, for everyone that's like, wait, what do I do now? So I just, I loved that. Um, and I'm not in the procurement space, so I'm gonna bring it back to more personal resilience and 
obviously that empowers us to do our best work every day. So, um, so first let's understand a little bit about the different aspects of the brain. If you were to be having a normal conversation with someone, let's say like we are here and we're coming up with ideas and everything's really feeling good, it's flowing, we're engaged, we're excited. And then all of a sudden you see a text from your boss and it says, I need you to call me right away, period. Here's what would happen in the brain. If that's a triggering experience for you, if that kind of is like, oh no, something's wrong, which it would be, at least for me, I think for a lot of us, right? If that's the response, if you had been in a plane uh, sorry, not a plane, but uh, if you were looking at a brain scan and you were flying over, you would just see all this activity like flying over New York at night in this front part of the brain, which is the newest part of the brain. It's where all of our resourcefulness is, our executive function, everything we need to problem solve and be engaged in work. This would be lit up on a brain scan like flying over New York at night. The second you get that text, these lights go dark, full power outage, and the activity moves to the back of the brain, which is where the creature, the, the oldest part of the brain lives. That's our fight or flight. It does not have executive function. It's not thinking, should I be worried about this? All it knows is I'm scared. We got to, you know, fight or flee or freeze. So what we want to know is the activity when we're looking at the brain scan of when we get triggered, go into that anxious place is we literally lose, we physically lose the resourcefulness which is why sometimes you're not at your best if you're in a fight with someone or you feel like you're in trouble with work and you're all tense, you just simply don't have the same access. So it's really important for us to know that if we wanna move from feeling anxious, which is back here, to empowered, we're literally going to need to change where the brain activity is happening. And we can do that consciously. It's not always easy, it's not always the easiest choice, but we can practice doing that so it becomes more natural and more easy. So um, one aspect of understanding, well, what gets us to this back brain so quickly sometimes is um, the question I'll, I'll pose is, what is the difference between feeling anxious and feeling excited? Well, physically, the symptoms are pretty similar. Our hands might sweat or other areas might sweat. And, you know, we can feel a little bit of the, the muscles, you know, we can feel that in our body. Um, our breathing might kind of be, our heart rate might speed up, our breathing might speed up. But the difference between whether that is anxious or excited is the meaning that we make about what's happening. So if the meaning we're making about something is either being worried about the outcome or uncertain about the outcome, because the old creature brain does not like uncertainty. It would rather be scared than uncertain. So if we are feeling scared or nervous or uncertain about the outcome, then it's gonna be, I'm anxious. If we instead are thinking, oh, this is gonna go great, this is a great opportunity for me to X, Y, Z, then you're gonna be excited about something if you're feeling optimistic essentially about the outcome. The only difference is the meaning that our brains are making. And so making new meanings is a huge thing that we can bring our attention to. Okay, how else can I think of this to better serve me? Um, if you're starting to feel in that anxious state, it's just the meaning that you're making about what's happening. And I don't say just to invalidate it, it's real for our experience, but it is also a choice uh, and we can practice choosing differently. So when we change the meaning, we're literally changing the experience of our experience. So my first invitation is in general, we want to start shifting the meaning. And then the brain can't be in fear and curiosity at the same time because fear activity is here. Curiosity, the activity is here. So when we ask ourselves questions, we're actually starting to deprioritize the activity here and bring activity here. This is what we want when we wanna to move to that resourceful state. So I'm gonna offer some questions that I think can help all of us move through those steps, anxious, resistance, acceptance, resourceful, and empowered. When we start asking questions here, we start bringing more attention to our resourceful place, and we're also building that self-efficacy that we need to feel empowered. So here are some questions that I think can help you and all of us move toward resiliency. When you're feeling anxious, the simple question, what am I experiencing right now? If you can label it, which part of the brain does the labeling? It's not this guy, it's here. So literally when you get out of being lost in the experience and you come back to, okay, what am I experiencing right now? And you're giving it words, you're starting to bring activity back up here. 
Then when we look at resistance, a question you can ask is, what am I resisting about what's happening or what could happen? And just see what comes up. And then essentially what we're gonna probably do is some form of the stages of grief. So there's a kind of an acronym from NLP I've adjusted just a touch, but essentially we start with a few bases. So first it's OMG, what is happening? That's a little bit of that shock. And then next it's what the heck? I've altered that a little bit. What the heck? That's our anger and our kind of powerlessness, frustration. But in anger, there is a little bit of um, empowerment coming in, a little bit of that, a little sense of I and anger. Um, and then we want to move to acceptance, which is okay. Again, not it's okay, but okay, this is happening. And then you can ask, so now what can I do? Now what, now what, what it, was it, what is something I can do to change this experience for me? What can I do to have some improvement, even a 10% improvement, what can I do? So we'd move through that process and then we're going to be able to be in a more resourceful place. So we talked a little bit about upgrading the meanings, which meanings solidify into beliefs. Um, so when we change our beliefs, we change the meanings, we change the experience of the experience. So we want to be asking those questions. What have I chosen to believe this means about me or to me? What would someone have to believe to have a 10% better experience than me right now? And all of that is coming here. So you're, you're moving from that anxious place. You're moving back to your resourceful place. Great things are happening. For choosing realistic optimism, you can ask, um, what good thing can come from this? Which is really hard when things are really hard. But when we're ready for them to be 10% better, then we can engage that question. What, what good can come from this? What good is possible in the future? Um, and I think, you know, Eva had a, that great phrase of just like, don't, uh, what is it? Don't let a, any crisis go wasted, something like that, right? Never let I, a good crisis go to waste. Thank you. So there we go. There's our like that, because we're often limited by what we expect. We rarely get more than what we expect. We're more likely to get where that limit, where that ceiling is. So we're starting to expand that out. And then choosing where you put your attention. In terms of being resourceful, I think this is actually the hardest one because sometimes it's just easier to be in the experience and to have the emotions. But when you're ready to shift and not actually be in that place, um, there's a great quote. It's an excellent book on resiliency. Actually, it's called Resilient by Rick Hansen. Highly, highly recommend it. And he has a great quote, which is you, the person you are, gradually become what your attention rests upon. And so when you're in a state of anxiousness, you want to choose, okay, where is my attention right now? And where is the most useful place I could put my attention to have the experience I want? Those two questions are definitely game changers. And our final step, some final questions to offer you, and this, these work great personally and in, in the workplace. Um, on the empowered place, or finally empowered, is possibility thinking. And I teach this in the inspiring accountability results model. So I use this in the workplace all the time. Two questions, what's in the way? That's kind of where we're labeling what's going on. And given what's in the way, what's possible? We so easily get stuck at what's in the way as a reason to resign, to give up, to move on to something else. But the truth is once we just label what's in the way and then we say, okay, well given that, what is possible? We're prompting our brain to think in a new way. If we don't ask the question, we probably will stay stuck. So I really love this framework for our personal life, professional life. Okay, let's talk about what's in the way. Let's not be unrealistic. There's a lot, oh, you have kids at home that you're supposed to teach and you're running a business and you're, yeah. Okay, well given all that, what is possible? It might be this much, but it's still gonna get you out of that panic anxious mode. So I think that's probably enough on that um, question. I do have some more, but let's come back to that maybe if we have time at the end. Elena, and I really like your, your, your call out about the attention part of that, because for me, I think that's the hardest as well. And so many people in the procurement industry have never worked remotely before. It's a heavily, heavily office-based industry. Sales and marketing is much more used to being remote or, or doing a combination. But for a lot of people in procurement, this is the first time they've ever worked from home for a month or two months. And then on top of that, you add in all the distractions of spouses, children. And so I think the attention piece is really, really part of what you mentioned to help people at least kind of reshift their focus and you're not going to be able to do everything but focus on the small wins that you can for your career and for your family and you'll be better off um, for it.
Absolutely. All right, Heather, I want to shift the conversation back to you again, representing the supplier community in procurement. And we've talked a lot about what's been happening during COVID, but at some point, things are going to shift. And what does resiliency look like to you as a small business owner in the procurement community post COVID-19? I think overall businesses um, and all the business units within it uh, will need to become more adaptable and more fluid. Um, working from home, for example, for non-tech companies was kind of a non-starter. It just, if you weren't in tech, you were usually working in a corporate office somewhere, a regional office. Um, our new reality is going to include new ways of how we get our work done, how effectively and efficiently that work gets done. Um, Eva kind of mentioned on the speed of making decisions earlier. And um, I think at the end of the day, um, good time management is also going to be a key um, aspect that people are going to need to acquire if they haven't had that already to be able to manage things working from home or just going back into the workplace and only working with a, a half of your team that you normally would have so that the social distancing thing is still happening within, you know, within the office. Um, overall, I think executives are going to need to have more of an open mind when it comes to new ideas that stakeholders bring to the table, um, especially when it comes to IT, supply chain and procurement. Um, as I believe deep down, these are the teams that are gonna be driving those companies to their new desired states. Everyone's sort of had to reevaluate where their company is gonna be in 2020, 2021, moving forward um, with what is going on. And if you are not able to be fluid and, and Sarah mentioned pivoting, you know, with, with what she's been doing with her own company, um, it's just not gonna happen. You're gonna be stuck and, and stuck in old processes that in, in today's times and tomorrow's times are just not gonna cut it anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Heather. Eva, as Heather just mentioned, things are going to be going different uh, moving forward. I mean, the world is just not going to be the same as we're used to. Personally and professionally, how can we and should we use this time right now in the most productive way? And I think, you know, a lot of the conversations I have with clients and colleagues right now is they're saying, I just feel so unproductive. I'm doing 20 things in an hour and I feel like I'm just getting nothing done. So what tips can you provide so we can try to be productive in this crazy state? Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, I'm smiling because, you know, maybe some of my answers may not be popular here, but um, I think, uh, you know, we are sort of past a critical stage, right, and sort of over the initial shock of, of the changes. Um, those of us who are still working, uh, you know, we're learning how to manage this new world. Um, I think we fall into two camps. You know, some of us are just so eager to get the hell out of the house and, um, you know, and, and start being in, in the world, and some of us still remain hesitant. You know, uh, we have seen uh, COVID hitting people personally, um, you know, and, and either with their families or themselves. And so um, they see people that may be, um, you know, autoimmune, um, you know, more, more open to, to the illness still. So there is some hesitancy to come back to the world that, that we knew before. And I think you're right, Sarah. Uh, a lot of procurement people that that I've worked with over the years, they would have loved to work from home, you know, 10 years from now. But somehow, you know, the management or the leadership said, you know, button the seat at eight o'clock. Well, I tell you what, those companies are feeling pretty silly now, I would say, right? Because um, all of a sudden we've been able to prove them wrong, that that we can indeed do a lot of these, uh, these jobs in a more flexible environment. Um, and so, I think the most important thing that we can do uh, right now, and uh, Elena touched on this beautifully, we don't want to uh, lose ourselves in this change, okay? Uh, it's easy to sort of become a runaway train and, and, and you know, kind of get on the, the, the pity party uh, train and woo me, I've either I've lost my job or I'm still working, I have to go to work, I don't like the environment, should I be in the elevator with somebody, should I not? So not sort of not losing ourselves to this change um, is really important. I know for myself, 
you know, I'm giving myself permission to be gentler um, to myself and, and to others, you know, and, and to be much more patient and, and tolerant. Uh, and those are the things that I'm learning um, as someone that maybe perhaps in the past have not been so patient or tolerant. Um, I'm learning to slow down and, and to be um, to be a little bit more kinder to myself. Um, Elena touched on this. I'll reiterate this. A little insight for you guys. A stressed out brain cannot be a creative brain, okay? And, uh, you know, Mr. Einstein said it beautifully. He said, creativity is the residue of wasted time. You know, this is a value that we don't value here in this country, right? We value productivity. You know, and I'm here to say, you know, that it's actually okay to maybe not be as productive as we used to be. I look at my, you know, in my case, uh, I'll give you an example. I came up with two completely new products for the marketplace in the last 10 weeks. I researched them and I filed patents on them. Now, how the heck did this happen? Because I had the time. I had the time to sit around, you know, and observe the world around me and uh, sort of come up with ideas and solutions that have not been thought of uh, previously. Not because I was super busy and operating on 20 different channels, but because I had the time to slow down long enough to observe the world in which I'm swimming, okay? So, so you know, being able to give yourself that time out. Um, you know, by, by the way, Sarah, I have written a book um, last year. It's called, pa it's titled Pause harnessing the, the period of in between, okay? And people thought I was crazy, you know? Uh, you know, pause was not something that we were accustomed to, and, and now we have a pause, you know, courtesy of a virus. And so, you know, we don't have to wait, and that was the, the theme of my book, you don't have to wait for these crises to instill some ability to pause and, and slow down. Um, you know, stress management um, is becoming a huge business in this country, right? For a reason, it works. Um, you know, the, the, this idea of being mindful and, and, you know, Elena talked so beautifully about, you know, some of the things that we can do to manage our anxiety levels and our stress level. I concur, you know, tuning in, slowing down, you know, reevaluating and rebooting. Um, all of the, the stuff that doesn't serve you um, should be carefully sifted out of your life, okay? I've become a master of saying no thank you, okay? Uh, and it, it just upsets me greatly when people say to me, I'm so busy, I got all these things happening. And I'm like, how much of that can you say no thank you to, okay? Uh, being busy, busy is not a badge of honor, all right? This is a great time to reimagine your life. And, and I, you know, and it's interesting because I see in my practice, a lot, of, a lot of clients come to me now and they're saying, help me be different. Help me move out of that train that I was on prior to COVID that has now given me a whole new appreciation for who I am. Help me be different. So this may be a good time to perform one of these, you know, stop, start, continue exercises, right? In your journaling uh, practice, what should you start? What should you stop? And what should you continue? Um, you know, take a look at the last eight weeks and reflect on how different um, you are and, you know, how the new fits you. You may actually kind of like it, right? Um, you know, are there some new skills that you've learned? Um, listen, I built my first website. I, I became a website designer in the last eight weeks. This was, um, this was magic to me 10 weeks ago. I had no idea how to do this, right? But I took on upon myself to say, I want to be up and up on this technology. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you need to say goodbye to? Not just clothes in your closet, right? But your outdated beliefs and outdated attitudes. What are some things that you can just get rid of? Um, you know, Mr. Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy uh, famously said that everyone wants to change the world, but only very few want to change themselves, okay? Um, this is a great, great opportunity um, to, to reevaluate who we are. Now, I will say that more, you know, sadly, some of us parted ways with our employers, um, you know, either involuntarily or because we chose to do so. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to pause. It's okay 
to, you know, not jump into kind of the next job. This is a great opportunity to uh, really reevaluate and, and uh, understand who you are as a person. So I really encourage people to, to pause, look around you, uh, understand what the skill set is that you have, how can you complement it, supplement it, be gentle with yourself, be kind. Um, the good things will come, this too shall pass. Eva, and <clears throat> talking about the pause button in, in my world, which is marketing, there's been a huge shift that's happened over the last eight or so weeks and many marketing teams have been eliminated completely or reduced a significant amount of their workforce. And the way that people in marketing are, are moving forward is completely having to shift and change. Yeah. The idea of being able to organize events and meet people in person is completely gone. The way that you're able to market and get in front of your customers is completely shifting. So a lot of people that I work with in the, the marketing and the marketing procurement space are having to completely pause yeah. and evaluate themselves and their skills, but also how they're going to move forward in their profession because the world of marketing is forever changed. Look, the, the, when I feel bad, you know, sad about my life, I, I look at, you know, I started as an, I, I came to this country from a completely different country, right? Didn't speak a word of English as an adult. Um, you know, I, um, I went from being an, an engineer to being a supply chain executive to being a managing director and learning about sales and, and revenue and pipelines, you know, when I was 45 to then pivoting to being a owner of my own business, to then pivoting to being a market research you know, professional, to now pivoting in my 50s to be a professor and learning a whole new world um, in, in academia. And so when I go back, and Elena talked about this, when I go back in my head and I map out you know, where I've been, you know, by the way, you know, terrible illnesses along the way, you know, uh, many houses being sold, you know, financial issues, you know, you start thinking about your life and you actually give yourself this great pat on the back. Like we've been through a lot as people, right? And so go back in memory and, and think about all the things that required you to pivot already and gain strength from that. Great advice. We've got about five minutes left. So Elena, I'm gonna have you close us out. And then if anyone listening has some questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we can, the panelists can um, quickly address them or, or we can address them after. I, I wanna end with some easy takeaways. We've had a, a lot of things talked about in this hour, but what are some easy tips that people can use to get to resiliency more quickly? Yeah, I, um... I love what Eva closed with in terms of she really hit on something that is like we have to indulge in and practice in the good that we've done, how far we've come. It's up to us to put it on into our own experience because when we kind of marinate in positive experiences and empowering in experiences, that's how we start to rewire our, the synapses in our brain which create new experiences. So choosing to really focus on, again, where's your attention? Choosing to focus and marinate in the feelings, the emotions is actually what creates neuroplasticity. So 100% um, agreement there. One thing I can offer is um, a tip I finally, I've heard almost all my life that I finally can understand why and I finally can accept it. Is granted, I don't like when people say this still, but when people say, just breathe, Take a breath. Now, I don't really recommend saying that to anyone. It still makes me not feel great. But I did learn um, a strategy about breathing that helps me actually be like, oh, this isn't just a pacifying thing. This is a strategy. So here's what I learned. There's two um, automatic nervous system systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. For the case here, we're gonna talk about the one that's the brake, the deaccelerator, and then the gas pedal, the accelerator. So what's happening is we're in such a time of stress, generally, most of us are feeling a lot more stress. And this accelerator is turned on. It's our fight or flight. It has the kind of negative neurochemicals and it's creating that cortisol in our body, which breaks down our body. And actually we don't become more resilient. We become more brittle over time when we are in this physical and emotional state of stress. 
And what we need is we need some of this heat accelerator in the system to calm down, to also don't really tell anyone, especially since this is a women's view on resiliency, don't tell people to calm down. So tip, there's tip number two woven in there. Um, and so we want to come back to this place, though, where we're offsetting, because it's like a seesaw, these two systems. They're like a seesaw. So so many of us have been so high up on this cortisol, stressing in our bodies. We're feeling it in every area of our life. And what we need is we need more of this over here, because this, when we are in a more relaxed state, we're having this kind of a bit of a pause, I would say, right, Eva? This is when our bodies repair and replenish. We can't, you can't run on a treadmill indefinitely you have to stop you have to take a break we're our bodies are not built that way our bodies are not resilient that way they're amazingly resilient but only when we tap into this so what people will say is well okay you need to make time to relax and you need to meditate and we all know that we all know that but do we do it sometimes maybe more than not so here's what i learned to work with these two systems is if you're going to choose to take a breath count your inhale and make your exhale longer because this system actually manages the inhale it's a little bit of a that's why when you're breathing really fast up here it feels kind of stressful so this system the stress system essentially is managing your inhale and this system is required for the exhale so when you breathe in one two three and you breathe out one two three four five six you are engaging this system and you are practicing that relaxation and so if you're like me and you kind of want to know why should I be doing that, um, for me, that really helped to be like, you know what, that's something I can choose to do. It doesn't take a lot of time and it is technically engaging a healthier part of my system to help me come to a more relaxed place. So I will leave you with that. We should all go and focus on our breathing for the rest of the week. <laughs> on our next conference calls, we'll all take a, take a, a breathing minute. Just don't yeah, tell them to do it. <laughs> yeah, lead by example. So we've got a couple questions coming in from the audience. We are at time, so if you do need to sign off, um, totally understand we are videoing this, so we'll be sharing this on social after. But Eva, I'm going to go ahead and uh, direct this question to you. It's from Mitch. He said that Sarah mentioned that in-person events are done. Let's take one, the Consumer Electronics Show, which has about 185,000 people in mm -hmm. Vegas every January. How will procurement change if these venues do not exist in the future? Yeah, um, listen, people are, uh, we will be in this world um, of, you know, everybody carries a contagion for a long time, right? Until we um, sort of sort out the medical side of this. And, um, you know, many organizations will be, um, will be indeed um, challenged with bringing people together. And I, I just don't know that that bringing people together will, will be possible uh, at such scale as 185,000 people, okay? And that's the reality. And so having said that, um, you know, the, the online platforms for event um, execution and planning have been around forever. We just haven't caught up, um, okay? We, again, we've, we've relied on what we've known. Um, now we are challenged, and, it, and and I think this is where procurement can really play a role to be on the lookout, to scout, to develop, um, you know, suppliers who offer these types of technologies. I mean, remote learning will be huge in the future, right? Um, if if you're looking to invest money, that's where we're going. Remote learning, uh, remote event participation. Um, we're, in fact, we're seeing a rise in uh, you know, events because we have the ability to bring people from around the world at a fraction of the cost. And so, you know, the, 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 again, my, my call to procurement people in this is to really step out of not, you know, don't be the sheep that follows everybody else, but to step out of the, the realm in which we live and say, how can we do this? How can we accomplish the same objective in different ways? Um, and there are amazing technologies, um, you know, absent face-to-face, -face, there are amazing technologies that can still bring people uh, together. I hate this notion of, you know, you know, social distancing. We are not social distancing, we're physically distancing. Uh, but socially, we are just as connected as we were. We just have to, to Elena's point, allow for the different uh, you know, parts of our brain to accept that as our new reality. 
Heather, what are your thoughts being on the supplier side of the discussion if venues cannot exist where we have mass amounts of people or large events? How is that going to shift for procurement suppliers? Um, I was just thinking of the example of using CES, you know, how are big trade shows like that going to attract people? Um, I, besides, you know, go to meeting in Zoom and Slack, you know, offering different channels. Um, perhaps, you know, venues that do big shows like that will have channels where their exhibitors will have a channel to showcase their product. And it's all done just virtually. So you can tune in at any time throughout, you know, a two or three day event and check out any number of uh, exhibitors that have, uh, you know, posted a, a demonstration and then maybe even go back and rewatch it if you wanted to, if you didn't, if you didn't catch it live. Um, so I think it's just a new, like everyone's been talking about, it's just a new way of how we are going to be doing things uh, moving forward um, with, with the except, you know, with, it. with respect to, um, you know, in-person large venue events um, and even sporting events. Like how, how are we going to be doing all of these things moving forward? There's a way to do it. We just, you know, have to work together to figure that out. I think yeah, Sarah, if I can just add, you know, the, the other big industry that's superbly growing and, and it's again, it's tied to some of the other stuff that I'm doing uh, research wise, but virtual reality, right, is becoming massive. And so when you start thinking about making investments as a company um, in virtual reality, it is a way to deliver an experience um, to the masses in, in, a, in a very sort of different way. Uh, but it still feels, uh, you know, really re real. So gaming technology, virtual reality technology, um, you know, online events, um, you know, that I know I've been researching now for, for at least 10 years. They've been around that long. We just haven't had the discipline or the patience to go there because it was easier to just hop on the plane and go, you know, and go see Sarah in, in New Jersey. Right. So, uh, um, yeah, but so I think, again, we, we need to, as procurement people, that's one of our jobs, right, is to bring new supply solutions to the company. Um, this is one of the tasks that, you know, if I was a CPO, I would be placing a lot of, a lot of uh, emphasis on is, is new solutions for my company. I think it's also important to note there, there's going to be a shift in the way that we consume information in procurement. A lot of it was doing face-to-face -face time with suppliers, uh, with the startup community or with stakeholders, and that is really shifting to on-demand content. So the procurement buy-side community is engaging by reading and watching more and more online and leveraging LinkedIn, and the supplier community is now being pushed and forced to create a lot of content that can be viewed at anyone's convenience. The other shift is being able to interact with people virtually. So there's a lot of online events as we've discussed, happy hours, meetups, one day conferences. I attended a four day procurement conference that I spoke at in May, which is a long time. But the, the challenge is not just having the event, but how do you engage online? So that's gonna be the next step of, yes, we have Zoom rooms. Elena, we were talking about this before the panel started. You are a trainer and you're used to having that, you know, engagement interaction and being on a Zoom is not the same thing. So how do we take it to the next step? So I think procurement will be tasked as well as the supplier community about how to have that engagement online. All right, well, if we have no other questions, uh, we are going to sign off. So a big thank you to ISM New Jersey for hosting this webinar series and to our panelists, Elena, Heather, and Ava. Thank you for bringing a woman's perspective to this important topic of resiliency. I encourage all of the listeners to connect with these rock stars on LinkedIn. They also, Elena and Eva both have books, so you can check out their books and get some more insightful information about this subject. So thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thanks everyone. Thanks Sarah, thank you, bye. bye.